about to roll up some fresh sour. We have AJ Sour Diesel on the podcast today, first smoke of the day. We talk about what happened to the sour, who's got the real sour, why the sour isn't what it used to be and what you know it as, and also how it started. The sour, you know? We also get in Dr. Dabber. If you want to try a Dr. Dabber product, all you got to do is go to fsotd.com, go to the sponsors page, and get hooked up with Dr. Dabber. We have the newest code right there on the site. Growgeneration.com, 60 stores nationwide, online or in store. Get hooked up, super simple, fsotd.com. It's all you got to do when you get the brand new discount code and you get hooked up. Growers, if you're not happy with your nutrient company and you want to try something different, Drip Hydro, super simple. Get connected to them. All you have to do is go to fsotd.com and hit sponsors. Get hooked up. And let's talk about some sour diesel. First smoke of the day, we have a big episode today. I know you've been talking sour. I know you've been hearing about sour. I know that's the convo amongst half the industry, if not most of the industry. Who's got the sour? Where's the real sour? What happened to the sour? This is the man. This is one of them. AJ Sour Diesel. Welcome to uh, First Smoke of the Day. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I always like to start off with a bang and everyone's talking sour diesel and everyone's talking variations and they want that profile back the sour profile Mm -hmm. i see some nugs in front of you what's uh what do you have on the rolling tray uh here i got a piece of grapefruit here's a piece of uh of sour that we're about to uh release Uh, in new york dude super funky super sweet super gassy so this is going to drop in new york yes and then the grapefruit, uh, could I see that as well? Yeah, yeah. Man, I haven't seen good grapefruit in a long time. Oh, yeah, dude. This would be incredible, I bet, if it washed as hash rosin too because of that essence that's deep in there. It gets super sweet and gassy. Mm-hmm. Wow. We used to get trickle down in Florida of some good grapefruit, and then we would get the haze, uh, and then sour was booming. Yeah, we used to get grapefruits from California back in the day, for sure. It's reminiscent of that. So, Where'd you grow up? I grew up all around uh, like the New York City area, New York State. Um, I was born in Manhattan, lived in the Bronx, lived in Yonkers. Then we moved up to uh, Fishkill, New York, which was a little bit further north, and then down to... Um, to uh, Mount Kisco in Westchester. And then eventually um, I was shipped off to boarding school. And then when I, once I graduated high school, I moved to New York City and that's where you know, I, I resided for most of my life. Was it boarding school because you were going the wrong way or because they just wanted structure for you? uh yeah i was i was kind of like not going to school every day and just hanging out with my friends and playing pool and smoking weed and so yeah the school and my parents decided it was time for a change so they sent me to uh you know a school for uh bad kids and uh and so yeah when i finally got out of there i moved to manhattan and i basically lived in new york city uh for the next you know 20s or so on some odd years lived in new york city till i was about 42. Yeah. wow that's the energy in new york is unlike anywhere in the world to go back to those days though first time smoking weed and what kind of weed was it because that's a specific time and place the first time i smoked weed was um was on christmas and it was uh, about 1982. um i was at a my mother's family was from massachusetts and i was at a family christmas gathering and i smoked weed with my cousin nick who was 14. i think i was like nine years old wow and that was so that was the first time um that's young that was an idea that was an isolated incident um until i was 12 Mm -hmm. and i smoked again with my camp counselors at uh summer camp and then um 
but it wasn't until I was like 14 that I started smoking on a regular basis. And what were you getting at that time? Was it like BCs or was that way before that? The first weed I was getting was the weed I stole from my stepfather that he used to hide in the freezer. So I would go into the freezer and take, you know, uh, you know, a handful. And that's, that was the plug for me and all my friends, you know? So I'd go see, I'd go stay with my mom on the weekend and then come home and all my friends would be like, you know, where's the weed? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And then eventually I started smoking Jamaican weed that I would buy from Jamaicans. Um, you in know, the park or whatever. Or uh, I had this York. one particular guy that had a, I would beep him and then he would, uh, you know, drop it off, deliver anywhere. And he would sell us like a, a, a $10 gram, you know, anywhere, anytime. So it was like. It's pretty sweet, you know. That's you can, convenient. You can beep him from the payphone at the mall or wherever, or any anywhere you were, he would come. You drive. So, and was it always different kinds, or was it usually the same? Strain? No, it was like that typical like Jamaican yard weed, you know, that very like bricked up, yeah, style of uh, yeah. And what are you doing at that time for work? And what what's your life like? Well, I mean, when this is when I was fourteen and fifteen. Oh, geez. That's when we were getting weed from the Jamaicans. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I didn't have any work. Um, yeah, then I went, by the time I went to boarding school, we mm -hmm. knew this guy in New York uh, named the Chief. And then, you know, we were just talking about, you know, Piff before, like you would call the Chief and uh, same thing, he would deliver you a gram of haze. It was like $35. And I think it might have even been a 0.7 of a gram, but it, but it looked like a gram anyway. And it was, it, but it was real haze. So, so yeah, in high school, that became the connect. And then we had the connect, this legendary guy, uh, Mark Crystal in New York City, who, you know, is pretty regionally famous there mm -hmm. as like every kid's like first weed connection. Really? Out of New York, huh? Yeah. 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 If you grew up in New York City, in my generation, you knew Mark Crystal, you know? So, um, so yeah, so I didn't, when I, when I graduated high school, that's when I like entered the workplace. Um, I started like going on Grateful Dead tour and hustling, you know, doing whatever, selling, you know, cigarettes and beer and water, whatever you kids did back then. So, I mean, and, 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 so after I did that for a while, like I actually took a, a, a job. I ended up working in a hospital um, doing uh, uh, some kind of like neurological testing on patients. So I would do that by day and then I would uh, sell weed by night. That was, um, you know, that was like when I was 19 out of high school and like, for, you know, first on my own. And, and so, you're yeah. living in New York City at this time. Yeah. Yeah. I was wow. living in Midtown Manhattan. As a 19 year old. Yeah. Yeah, dude. In the mix. That's that New York hustle though. I do this during the day and then at night I got this other hustle. Yeah. Like that's very New York. Yeah. That's what, we, that's what we did, you know, like, and we were always on the hustle. I mean, we sold a lot of Mexican weed back then. Uh, me and all my friends, we did, um, you know, mushrooms and stuff like that, you know. That's big now. It's coming resurgence that was, this year. That was like 1992, 93. So. And some of the guys that you hear about now, I know we talked about JJ from Top Dog. Have you're just kind of floating through the New York weed scene at this point, haven't gotten into the sour yet. It's usually piff is what you're seeing at that point. I went to Amsterdam in 1992. And so at Northern Lights was really popular. And when I got back from Amsterdam, um, I, uh, I met a guy out at this club in New York called Wetlands. I met this guy, uh, who, had, who was like, you know, you want to buy some weed? And I was like, yeah, I'll sell you some weed. And so we both kind of tried to sell each other weed. <laughs> but his weed was way better. You know, I was trying to sell him Mexican weed and he had really good weed. And he said, this is Northern Lights. So, um, and it was better than all the, the Northern Lights I'd been, you know, smoking that I'd seen in Amsterdam. Because at that time, every coffee shop in Amsterdam, you go in, it's Northern Lights. So that was their top shelf. So, um, so yeah, so... That's, that, that's how I met JJ, you know, uh, in 1992, I was like a kid. He was like 10 years older than me. And, um, and so he started selling me Northern Lights and all this other uh, indoor that he was getting. And, uh, you know, and we had a few connections to get good weed 
back then, but it was mostly California weed. And, you know, there was a couple other good things around, but like, but, uh, but JJ became like a really good connection for me back then. So you guys were living in the same area, but you met in Amsterdam. No, we met in a club in New York. Oh, okay. But gotcha. I had just seen a lot of Northern Lights in Amsterdam and then he busted out some Northern Lights and, you know, it was, it was incredible. It, it was better than all the Northern Lights I'd been seeing in Europe and, and, and wherever. So yeah, he had the best weed at that time that we could get all the time. I mean, man, that goes way back to, well, this is early nineties, huh? 92, you said? 92. Jeez. And he was getting it from this guy, uh, uh, who they call the weasel. And then, but the weasel used to hang out at wetlands, the club. So I used to, I eventually met the weasel as well. And, you know, eventually, um, by 1993, he was growing chem dog, the chem 91. It's my favorite version of it. And once he started growing that and putting it out, um, that was it. Like, like, so <clears throat> nobody wanted to, uh, uh, call anything chem at that time because there was such a qualitative difference between good weed and bad weed at that time that that um that like you didn't you didn't want to freak people out into thinking that the the weed was somehow altered or 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 laced right so so i was i didn't think chem was a good name so i started calling it the diesel and so very quickly that caught on and since jj and i knew a lot of the same people everyone nobody was asking for chem everyone was asking for diesel so so um so yeah so me and jj just started calling it the diesel because that's what that's what they wanted as soon as as, as soon as i called it that and that's what people identified that that variety with and that's what they wanted so um great yeah, so, strain so we all started fighting over over that weed every time the weasel would show up to wetlands you know we like me and jj would be like you know like battling each other to trying you know and he'd you know he'd be like i'm splitting it evenly so <laughs> so uh you think he was growing it or do you think he was just one off from the grower the weasel no yeah. no he was definitely growing it. yeah yeah you can always tell when it's that good it's like it's either him or the guy right behind him you know it has to be yeah no it was def it was him yeah. um uh, he i got to know him well over the years it was definitely him <laughs> it's a great name <laughs> we ended too. up being neighbors eventually um but uh but yeah so you know so he became the weasel basically became you know the boss of everyone right because when, if he said jump if he said meet me here right now you know or you, you were there uh if he, eventually you know he would make us go all the way to staten island to get it we didn't even care we would go um because he's the plug we needed it yeah, yeah he was the only way to get that weed and that was like there was such a qualitative difference between that weed and everything else even the best weed below it so he must have gotten the chem early because that's early on you know that was it wasn't passed around at all by then no he had met greg and um and he had traded greg uh uh this plant called the rfk that came, literally came from a bag seed from rfk stadium from a dead show so he was the same way like you know like the chem came out of a a a, a, a you know an, an interaction at, at a grateful dead show so did the rfk and so the rfk uh it wasn't as good as the camp, but back then it was still really good. And so it was worth it. Greg thought to trade this guy a cut. So the weasel and Greg and, and chem dog traded those cuts back then. Man, to be there and watch that go down and then to reflect on it. Jeez. So, yeah. So pretty soon everyone was like crazy for the diesel. And, um, meanwhile, I kept going back to Amsterdam. Were you going back for the cannabis cup or just traveling there? I never went for the cup. I always went in the summer. You kind of got to go to Amsterdam in the summer. I mean, it's not, it's a different place. In, it in, is. And in, I, in I can't winter. believe people are riding bikes till 10 PM full families. The one thing I noticed first was like, you know, it gets dark and in USA, all the lights go on in the houses because everyone's home inside the house there. I'm going around and half the lights are still off in the city because people are out and about still mm -hmm. on bikes, moving around at dinner you know it just all over and i was like oh this is yeah, it gets dark this. at like 3 30 in the afternoon <laughs> yeah so yeah i like to go when the days are long not short but um so i never i never went to the first cannabis cup i ever went to in amsterdam was in 2014 and i always just went 
from May to August. Damn, bro, you got a dab everywhere we go. It's discreet, it's portable, nobody knows. DrDabber.com, use the code, get your excess now. You land in Amsterdam once you're in the know, and what what do you do? What's the go-tos like? Like, what were your favorite spots to hit? The Katsu is, was always the first stop on the tour. Well, usually the morning flights. Um, so usually I'd smoke my own weed at like Barney's breakfast bar and have breakfast, right? But, or, you know, some, if I got there early enough, I'd do the, uh, the breakfast buffet at the Krasnopolsky Hotel, right? Like that, they have a good one. <laughs> I like this, okay. <laughs> so, um, but uh, I just started going there a lot because, yeah, because I could get NL5 Haze from Katsu, um, what they called the NL Special. Um, I, there was just good, I, met, I had met Adam Dunn there, and so whenever I went to Amsterdam, all, that, that became the thing, you know, go check in with the CIA, they called themselves, or the KGB. Um, go check in with those guys because they would tell you what's going on, if there's a party, if what's, what's happening, right? So um, I made good friends with all of them and because uh, I just kept coming, I would come back every like few weeks. I figured out that it was cheaper to live in Amsterdam on vacation than it was to live in New York at home because uh, – the Gilder made everything so affordable. So I would go to Amsterdam, you know, on a minute's notice. You get a flight for two hundred and fifty dollars round trip and just go. Well, and at that time you're probably still getting arrested in New York for small amounts of weed. So then you go to Amsterdam and you're like, this is like it's going where you're celebrating, yeah, not the where you're talking about the Giuliani uh, era. And he was, you know, he was trying to make a strong point in the beginning. So yeah, it was dangerous to have to smoke weed on the street in New York. Um so but I'd go to Amsterdam and because uh, I was just in love with the city and, you know, and it was something uh, uh, I could do to go smoke all different weed and all, you know, different stuff. So eventually I had this harebrained scheme that I could, uh, uh, you know, ship a whole bunch of weed from Amsterdam back to uh, uh, America. It was like a ridiculous idea because, um, because I had a friend who had diplomatic immunity, but he... Uh, his father was uh, 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 worked for the Syrian government. I didn't even realize that this that this that wasn't the good kind of, of diplomatic community to have, right? Like we, I didn't know anything about geopolitics, but I was like, my friend has diplomatic immunity, and he's getting, you know, we're gonna send this to him. So, so I sent him a package from Amsterdam, and it was actually weed that Adam Dunn had grown. Um, it was the uh, the five way sativa silver pearl which was uh, really nice stuff. So Silver Pearl has such a crazy nose. Very unique. Yeah. So when I went back to New York with that, um, I saw the weasel shortly thereafter uh, in Sheep's Meadow in Central Park. And I, I showed it to him and he was so impressed with it that within two days, he caught a flight to Amsterdam and, uh, and took his first trip there. And when he came back, he had seeds with him. And those would be the seeds that would eventually potentially uh, father the genetics that that uh, bore the sour. So, uh, so he came back from Amsterdam with uh, NL five, um, Sensi seed super skunk, um, a Hawaiian indica, and I believe an oasis. And, uh, I think those, I think that was it, but so that's then all, then all those types of, um, varieties started coming out of his garden. So, you know, all of a sudden it was, it was just diesel, but now, uh, we're getting all these different things. And now everyone's like, dude, please just grow the diesel. Like, fuck all this other stuff, please. We just want the diesel. You know, if you're a grower, like, you know, like every time you try to show people something different, there's like one particular thing they want from you. And it's like, you can't, you can show them the most, the best thing in the world. They don't care. So we were like that. We were like, no, nah, it's we don't a want concert, that. right? ACDC comes up. You're like, play, you yeah, know, yeah, and don't play the new album. No, yeah, no. Yeah. We want to hear the hits again. Yeah. yeah. So he did uh, uh, eventually start growing diesel again. And, uh, but this time when it came out, uh, there were some seeds and, uh, by now these guys who, uh, 
who I had first introduced to the diesel had, had poached out uh, the weasel and found him because it was, you know, it was a small scene, you know, so they, they had made con a connection. So now there was three of us splitting all the weed. And um, so those guys were from Albany. So those guys got weed with some seeds in it. I got weed. I found one seed in it. And, uh, and, and so that's kind of like where it all began with like us. So next thing you know, it's like we... <laughs> the natural progression was that we had to start growing weed immediately because he, he would never like the, the weasel would never give us clones. He hated that we had, we had found seeds of it. And like, you know, uh, he didn't, nobody wanted it getting out. I knew guys like that. Yeah. So we had that, we had the shit. We just had to like figure out how to grow it. And so that's, that's when, um, yeah, that's when we all started growing weed. And um, it was a blessing though, that seed. It's funny how you see it in different ways. Some people would be upset. There's a seed in my weed. Some people would be like, hold on. There's a career right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there's a whole future inside yes. of the seed. And I knew that, uh, you know, I knew that just looking at the, at that. So, and so did, and so did the Albany guys. <laughs> so, uh, these two kids from Albany, uh, uh, Mike and V, they planted two seeds and from there they got uh, what they were calling uh, diesel one and diesel two. And um, from, I believe it was diesel one came another seed and that seed uh, uh, eventually would be called sour. So that, that's really like the long, the roundabout story. It's like, mm -hmm. so. I bet it was sketchy know. trying to get grow equipment at that time too. Yeah. So it's like the risk is high. And then to plant two seeds and just, uh, it's a lot of, you know, dice rolling for something that you don't even see where it's going. Right. It's like, they were like, you're a great opportunity. And then for it to become that is crazy. Yeah, no, that's what, that's really what inspired us, you know, to, uh, to get started because we were just, we had so much anxiety about like not being able to get enough diesel that like we would have done anything, you know, we, we would have figured anything out. And so that's really how it all got started. And so, um, and it was the, the, the sour, the, the, I had, I had a seed of, of, from that same round of seeds. And, uh, it was more just like, I just called it the diesel and it wasn't really like the sour. It was more like the chem and, um, and yeah. And eventually that, uh, uh, I, I, had to move out of my house and gave the plants to somebody. And, you know, this, as the story goes, um, they didn't really take care of it the way they should have. And, and so that now my seed was gone. So I moved back to New York, uh, uh, from where, I, from having a farm in upstate New York in like 1997. And I started growing the cut of sour diesel there in New York. And so, yeah. And so because, I consistently put it out all that time uh, up until like 2012. Um, it became known as uh, they call it I, unbeknownst to me, they started calling it the AJ sour and that's, and that's how it became that. That's when, you know, it's good because they have to distinguish that that's a different one, right? It's like, <clears throat> if it's all just sour, it's sour, but no, like, no, this is the, the AJ sour version, which is the one that you want, right? It's like, so thank God for those guys also to keep it in and not have an issue and be able to keep this thing going because so many amazing strains over the years have been lost to just like you said, I had to move out of here. I didn't know what to do. Lost the cut mm -hmm. or had to get rid of it. Or I mean, a hundred, a thousand different things can happen. And honestly, some of the best cuts in the history of cannabis have been lost in ways like that mm -hmm. because it was so underground still. Mm -hmm. Like you're going to jail for those plants if those if something happens. Yeah, we risked a lot back then. It was great. It was it was real, real crime. I never thought I'd be sitting here confessing to a camera in front of a microphone. Yeah, well, and have a literally a legality in California where you can grow a certain amount of plants. So if you wanted to hunt down the next sour, it's the the recipe is in your hands. There's so many seed producers. Like you could find the next OG. You could find the next NL. Yeah, I like, mean, look, the sour was random, so yeah, it's a. If you're actually putting in some effort to look for stuff, then you should. 
shouldn't be too hard to find. And it's unique. That's the key to it. Before that, there wasn't anything like that, Mm -hmm. right? It's like we lose some of that because now a lot of times it's like, oh, that reminds me of this. That was that is very unique. You you can't really pinpoint something previous to that where you're like, oh, that's just like that. Yeah. That's where it makes its own lane in the industry. Yeah, because everything is like, you know, homogenizing, you know. I mean, eventually, you know, everything has the same recessive traits if you just keep working with what's there, right? Yeah. So and so diesel one and diesel two, did they keep both around or did they end up just picking the one and you rocked I with think that? they're both out there. Yeah, yeah. I, thought, I don't know. Someone was talking about potentially having recovered them. So we'll see. You know, I hope people that are sitting on those old seeds start to pop them. Yeah, it would be interesting, you know, people mm-hmm. stash stuff away. So at this time when you're growing this sour and like, obviously people start to distinguish this is AJ sour. Is it hitting the streets in New York? And do you mind talking about that part? Where's it going? How are you getting rid of some of this sour? And it becomes this hype. Well, at first, I was just ecstatic because I had this product that I could sell for a lot of money. That was very easy to sell. The, the hardest part about selling it was telling people they could only have a little bit. And, um, and the hardest part about selling it was that you knew that somebody was always going to be pissed off at you because, you know, you, you, you forgot about them or, you know, you just, you, you didn't have the bandwidth to just, you know, go around like delivering it to this many people. So in the beginning it was like, wow, cool. You know, I've got like a product I can sell really fast. You know, I could charge anything for it. And they'll still buy it, you know, 9,600 a pound, no problem. So, um, so yeah and then eventually you know it's like this um it's like if you won the lottery and uh and everybody knows that you just got really rich you know everyone comes out of the woodwork to be your best friend and to and to so it's like you just got all these people like hey man what's up and you know you you got to go through the motions of like a 15 or 30 second phone conversation to be like, what do you want? You know, like, like, Oh, Hey, by the way, yeah, I did want something, you know? So, you know, I kind of like isolated myself and cut a lot of that out of my life. Cause I just couldn't, you know, it was just too much. And, uh, and so eventually I would just deal with like a few people and, you know, did you have people leaning on you for the cut at that time? Any people like, man, cause they see what you're doing with it. I sold cuts to a lot of people because what I realized is, is that if you didn't know what you were doing, look, you couldn't, you couldn't, it's really easy to figure out how to do it today because everyone's already figured it out and they've already like explained it. You can go online and look at that. But uh, back then this was like unraveling a mystery in the dark. And so I never worried, even if they did figure it out and grew great, great weed, great. I'll buy it from you because I could definitely get a better price than you can even, you know, like, and, and there was such a vacuum and a demand for it that it was unfathomable that that demand could ever be sated. So it didn't matter. Like, it's not like now where if you let out maybe a a really in demand cut in LA, it might, you know, it might actually hurt your business in the next few months. Back then you could almost let it out knowing most people three out of four will lose it within a year or two. Yeah, no, I mean, look, I sold it to the same people over and over again. Yeah, 3,000 a tray every time. So, uh, but back then, you know, we used the 100 trays. So at least they got 100 clones. But, I, you know, okay. I'd tell them the first one is $3,000 and the rest are free. So, um, but yeah, they would buy them over and over again. And yeah, then I, they would, it would never pan out to be anything good, you know? And I'd say, you know, if you want to hire me to actually come help you build this thing and do it all, you know, and I, I did that for a lot of people. Um, and then they were more successful. That's gotta be crazy too. At that time in New York, trying to, uh, anytime you're trying to set up a grow for somebody, there's so many other things that come into play with ex-girlfriends, girlfriends, where they're living, landlords, um, them wanting a grow, but not wanting to put in the work or them thinking they're going to make 
you know, a million dollars and not making a million. Like, it, it's a very interesting relationship you build immediately with people doing well, that's that. That's what I, I learned right off the bat that don't make partnerships with people. Just get paid on the front end and then run away because this, this ship's probably going down. There's like a 75% chance this is gone in six months anyway. So, um, but they, you know, and, and, Sometimes though they would succeed, and a lot of a lot of people went on to do really well. You know, with you know starting out with my clone consultation and equipment package that I offered. But yeah, I had a I had a uh, an apartment in a warehouse in Brooklyn, and I had a loading dock, and we could have truck deliveries and a service elevator. So I would order equipment for people all the time, you know, and uh-huh. that was just like another service I'd provide. Cause I knew all the guys at the hydro store and I could just call them and like have them come down in the middle of the night. Um, so, so yeah, I did. I was never like afraid of a little competition with the sour because I, there was, it was. The demand was a hundred times what you could provide, no matter who got it and what you could go. Yeah, exactly. And most of the people that bought it were either rich or drug dealers basically you know because that's that's who could afford it and and a lot of them would buy it and keep it for themselves and you know they'd buy a pound and wouldn't do anything with it some some people bought it and sold it for you know 100 or 150 dollars more an ounce than i sold it to them for uh you know i heard all sorts of crazy stories over the years if you're not happy with your current nutrient company or you're not happy with how your products or flour is coming out, try Drip Hydro. All you got to do is go to FSOTD.com, get the discount code and DripHydro.com or grow generation stores nationwide, online or in store, we get you hooked up. You got to try Drip Hydro. Everybody's switching to Drip and whether you want to come in store or you need a drop straight to your facility, Grow Generation can help you out there. Tell them the First Smoke family sent you and get on Drip Hydro now i bet you heard a lot too about like hey this person's asking for the sour celebrity you know what i'm saying rappers it it trickled down because it became one of the biggest things if not the biggest thing in that time yeah i mean yeah i don't i don't know i feel i don't want to call them all out but i still need a bunch of rappers you know (laughs) so the sour bro everybody talks about it i remember getting it for the first time i was mind blown yeah it was like oh i've never smelled anything like this and then the structure of it's different. Everything about it is very different than anything you've had before. The it's growing like, it is different. Exactly. Vigorous. Yeah, it's like, you know, it needs to be tamed. It's a it's a hedge. So Yeah, we used to get good sour in Florida. Oh man, I miss those days. And that's what's funny is the topic is it's funny every 10 years, just like fashion or anything else, a lot of things, uh, it comes back around and now people are hunting down the sour, do anything for the cut, trying to figure out how to get it in their garden or breed with it or, you know, bring it back. And uh, it's just, it's interesting to see the cycle and and how it just keeps going. Well, what's interesting to me is that everyone has a different interpretation of what it is because there was so much counterfeit sour and because people put out so many weird sour crosses that like, you know, when I, when I was, um, when I was living up in the Bay Area uh, the last few years, I collected any sour cuts because people would always say, I have your cut. So I'd say, okay, can I have, a, can I have one? You know, and then I, I'd run it to see what it looked like. And, you know, at one point uh, back in uh, 2022, I ran, you know, five different sour cuts all next to each other just to, uh, you know, just to compare and contrast. Were they all different? None of them were real sour cuts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, whether it was from Vermont, whether you know, I had we had the Vermont sour, we had the 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 Mendocino sour, we had the uh, the Humboldt sour. You know, all the different, all the the AJ Philly cut sour, and they were all great, but they just weren't it. Yeah. So a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, you almost have to grow. I was I was saying like to, uh, you know, when I when I'm talking to uh, Sid at Flower House, you know, who we're releasing sour with in New York. Like, I'm like, we should just grow all these different cuts just to be like, you know, like, which, which, what's your sour then? You know, because oh. that's, a, that, this, that's not your sour. Well, you know, maybe this is your sour or maybe you remember this sour, you know, people. That's a great idea that people would go crazy over that. 
You got 15 different kinds of sour, yeah, I mean, 12 yeah. different we sours. We need like a 23 them. and me for sour, you know, because yeah. there's so many different, you know, sours. And then you, then, oh man, then it layers. It's like, now you start to do hash holes or blends where you take sour number 23 and you click it with the 15 and you do a 50, 50 blend. And I mean, that gets, that's very cool, man. I love it. So in New York, where you're launching out of, where? Uh, we're launching at a flower house uh, in New York. Yeah. And when's that happen? In a couple of weeks, you know, we'll see when it all comes together, uh, you know, sometime in November. Man, congratulations on that. Yeah. Thank you. It's, uh, yeah, it's great to have legal weed in New York. And it's just starting, you know, like the opening of what you're doing, where flowers are going to be on the shelves available and the OGs are coming out of the woodwork to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. I love hearing that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I saw that a lot. I was at uh, I was at an opening last week in downtown on the Lower East Side at this place called um, Con Bud. If you heard of those guys, it's all ex cons that work there, and uh, it's cool because it's like that's what it is. It's like everyone who, who works there is somehow like connected to like the street or like you know or or the the weed, and it's it's cool because you know like. They, they should have that. Yeah. When we were in New York, we went to Pizza Push's spot. Okay, yeah. And then we went to Astor Club. Mm -hmm. And then the THC Museum has that new lounge that they just opened. That okay, was really interesting. I've been to the THC Museum. Yeah. That's probably the coolest lounge I've been to as far as just square footage, where you're at. You're right by Supreme and like all these other stores in that area. And then uh, they just opened it up, I think, the lounge side. But yeah, it was... New York, I love seeing what they're doing. It's mm -hmm. very cool. We spent the last two 420s there, and it's unlike any 420 I've ever been to in the, anywhere in the world. Oh, yeah, yeah. I went to Washington Square Park for 420. It was pretty crazy. Wasn't it? Yeah. yeah I've, it, it still doesn't feel right to me. See, I the OGs still, always say that. They're like, are we sure right. we could do this? Yeah. yeah. A, I still don't trust it, but, um, but yeah, it was cool. Oh, it's thousands and thousands of people. It's like a celebration of cannabis and freedom. Mm -hmm. dabbing smoking like performers like i mean it was epic that was to see it where it was where you would get arrested for a stem or a tiny piece of but point two to where it is now night and day new york was weird though because like we also had like places like you know galaxy did you ever go to that spot mm -hmm. and, like this weird place that sold hemp burgers and drinks and you could just go in there and smoke weed it was like all through the 90s you could smoke weed in there for some reason it was okay that on that one place in that in that one corner and and you know but anywhere else you couldn't do that so um weird they never got raided it was just mm -hmm. it just sort of happened so that was like you know we always had smoking lounges it was just totally different and then the deliveries in new york are something way different they kind of started that model in my opinion yeah they took it to a whole level where guys would show up with trapper keepers you know 10 20 different kinds of strains hash i mean gummies like mm -hmm. did you ever as your journey starts through new york and you're putting out sour do you work with deliveries or is most of your stuff you know how, how is that going and then where does it evolve to there yeah there was a couple of the, it's funny what's funny is uh my friend and I actually started a delivery service back in like 2002, but we were both so like spoiled and entitled, you know, like we didn't want to do anything. And uh, so we fought over like who would make the deliveries when no one else was around to do it. And then we ended up shutting it down. You know, we sold two grams of weed for a hundred dollars and the phone rang like several times a day. And, uh, and then we got lazy. So we started making people do a 10, 10 jar minimum. So you had to spend a thousand dollars or we're not coming. And it's, it's, you get 10, two gram jars. So, uh, so yeah, we, we, you know, if you do the math, that's, that's pretty good. Right. So, um, but we were just, uh, you know, we were, we were too spoiled to even go out and collect the, the, the free money. We just would rather, you know, sit around and do something else. So uh, we let that go. But were yeah, you branding it out at that time? Were you just calling it sour or AJ sour? We would go to Bed Bath & Beyond and we would just buy spice rack jars and we would just put the, uh, the only thing uh, my buddy did for branding is, uh, you know, every time someone 
would hit the joint, they would say, that's tasty. I'd say, that's tasty. It just comes out. Like, you know what I mean? It's weird. Like, no matter who you are, you say it. And so um, my buddy would hand them a business card that says, that's tasty. You just smoked real sour diesel. And then there would be the number for the, for the, the, for the business on the back. But um, yeah, that was short-lived. It lasted maybe three months and we just gave up on it. It's also safer not to do that at that time too, I'm sure, exposing yourself you know, to a, a, a random customer. So where's the journey go from there? As you start to uh, cultivate, you meet people like JJ. Mm -hmm. And are you still keeping in touch with these people in New York? Are you running into other uh, OGs? Yeah, I mean, um, we all hung out in Sheep's Meadow back in the day. So like everyone kind of knew everyone. That was like, that was the internet. You know, you go to Sheep's Meadow and that's where you're going to see everybody, you know, in Central Park. And so it was kind of like Sheep's Meadow by day. And then on Tuesday nights, everyone would go to this club downtown called Wetlands, which was like the Grateful Dead themed uh, nightclub. And and so um, and so yeah, everyone kind of like met everyone and touched base in places like that, and going to like obviously Grateful Dead shows. But um, so Sheep's Head Meadow is you know Sheep's Sheep's uh, Sheep's Meadow. Sheep's Meadow is in Central Park. Yes. So that's an OG spot to smoke weed. I mean, you guys are talking about oh it that God, far yeah. back. When I was like 15, I used to buy acid in Sheep's uh, uh, Meadow. It was like the, you could buy any drug in Sheep's Meadow. Um, I got to go smoke a joint there the next time I'm in New York. Yeah, Giuliani kind of shut it down. But like in the, in the 80s and like early 90s, Sheep's Meadow was like a drug supermarket. And it was like a place where you could go hang out and sit on the grass, you know, smoke joints and whatever. New York's epic like that. Um, so you put out the sour, mom, I'm guessing we're getting into probably like the mid two thousands at that point. Yeah. Well, like it was like 97, we started, I started putting out sour and then by, by 99, uh, uh, it had become quite a phenomenon. I mean, it, it was a phenomenon in 96, you know, when it first hit, you know, so those guys used to always bring their sour. The, the Albany kids would bring me their sour when they first grew up because they knew that I will get you the highest price for it than anyone, you know? And, and, I and I'd tell people that. I'd be like, just bring me the best weed. Watch me sell it. And then I'll pay you like way more, you know, than anyone else will pay you for it. You know, people would be trying to get 6,400 and I'd be like, no, 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 no. I'm going to get you eight. You know, and that's how I got all the good, you know, that was, you had to like get these people to bring you the weed and wanted only deal with you. That was always the strategy. And so, um, so I had worked it up so that the prices were really high. Once I started growing it, I had like created this insane market for myself. When you started, were you soil pots or cocoa or do you guys oh, do yeah, hydro? We used Promix. Yeah. We used Promix and General Hydro. <laughs> that was like, that was a the, great combo. That was the magic formula. I know guys that still kill it with that formula. Probably, yeah, yeah. And thousand watt bulbs. Mm -hmm. I used to hear about people having to climb light poles and undo bulbs in the beginning before the hydro stores were plenty around or oh, even I, accessible. I, we stole a street lamp. I had to grow with a re, with an actual like street lamp head hanging in a closet. Can you imagine? <laughs> Wong, 6 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> hear that ballast humming. Yeah. <laughs> And so you're growing the sour at this time. Where are you able to grow it? How, where, what kind of space? Um, well, I had, uh, uh, well, when I first started growing weed, I was growing in a, uh, in my doorman building apartment. I was living in an alcove studio in Manhattan in Midtown. And um, so I turned the kitchen. It had a walk-in kitchen. So I turned that into the veg. And then... It had like an alcove. So I took the closet doors off and like, you know, made the alcove bigger. And then I hung a thousand watt metal halide lamp there. And uh, that's how I started. And then, you know, we didn't have um, carbon filters or anything like that. There was no charcoal stuff on the market. All right. We just, I was living in an apartment building. So yeah, the whole building smelled. Every other month they're like, um, <laughs> it's insane smell and it smells like a skunk. 
Yeah. So eventually I had to move out of there. Um, I got a letter from the local police precinct basically saying move or else. So, so I moved out of there and that's, uh, I moved up to, uh, Hunter mountain, which is in the Catskills. Is that where they ski and snowboard? Yes. Okay. I've heard of this. Yeah. I moved up to the Catskills cause that's where it was like the wild west. You could do whatever you wanted up there. No one cared. They didn't check credit and references if you went up there with cash you left with the key to a house and that's what happened so uh so then i started i rented a house up there and started growing up there and that's where i really like cut my teeth and learned learned how to grow and my my first grow was like you know 2000 watt lights in the basement on one of those sun circles that like spins around you know those were awesome when they first came out i i remember being like god i wish i had the money to do this yeah <laughs> yeah and then after my first harvest there then i upgraded to the three arm sun circle you know so i got an extra light and then eventually started do, hanging lights in the upstairs of the house and and yeah so by the time i left you know i probably had you know you know about 10 lights in total in that house all so, just plugged into the house yeah Woo. so so by 1990 believe it or not it was only like like 400 bucks a month back then, oh, which wasn't really even a lot, you know? So for reference for people, it'd probably be about 3000 to yeah. 3,500 bucks a month at this point. Uh, in California. Yeah. yeah. So probably uh, right in there. Man, I'm sick of spending so much time going to the store, having to make all these runs and load all this shit up. So what are you doing here? It's hash making day. I'm always at Grow Generation. If you don't want to have to always go into the store, it's super easy. They deliver 60 plus stores nationwide, delivery right to your doorstep and discreet. GrowGeneration.com. Use the code, tell them the family sent you, and get hooked up. Yeah, those were the old analog uh, ballasts too that oh. made that buzzing noise and oh, got real they hot. get hot. So you yeah. end up putting them on legs and throw a fan on those. So now you're adding more electric to the thing. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be like hard to carry two at a time. Um, so then from there, I moved down to, um, to an apartment in Brooklyn because now I knew if I can just get like four to six lights going, you know, we'll make plenty of money. Like we don't even need to, to, you know, we can keep it small, live in New York. And so, yeah, I went back and did that. You just like living in the city better or, uh, you just felt like I can do this more efficiently and, and live in a better place or. Yeah. Yeah. It was time to move back to the city because everything, uh, my family and all my interests were there. So, um, so yeah. So, you know, so that's what, that's when I started growing in, uh, in the city again and I got caught by my landlord, but was luckily able to, uh, bribe him with $10,000 to let me finish there. Then I moved on to, uh, then I moved over to the Williamsburg side of Brooklyn. How's and, that happen? Give, give me the rundown. Uh, How's he find out? Does he just go in the apartment for a fix? Or? A pipe. It was a really cold night. A pipe burst. I guess maybe it was my fault because I had the heat turned off. A pipe burst. Three in the morning, landlord shows up banging on the door, raining downstairs. And, and so he comes inside. and. He runs to the door, it's locked, you know. I said, oh, I have a key for that. So I opened the door. I'm like, I guess, you know, uh -huh. now you know. And uh, yeah, he was shocked because there were like six foot tall sour plants that were like, you know, like literally like two weeks away from being finished. Oh yeah, that's an aggressive, for anyone who hasn't seen that, that's a and so I was like, I was like, you know, don't call the cops, man. Don't call the cops. I'll, we'll work this out. I swear I'm going to make this worth it to you. You know, I was like, I'll give you, I'll give you $10,000. And, and so he was like, okay. You, you know, go from freaking out. Like, no, I don't know. To, oh, okay. okay yeah. He yeah. was like, okay, okay. I said, that'll <laughs> cover any damages. Right. So, uh, so, so yeah, so he, I paid him off and then I moved over to the, the, the east side of Brooklyn to, uh, or the west side of Brooklyn to, uh, to Williamsburg. And, um, yeah. And then from there, I just started getting like, commercial spaces and any apartments I could find, I would get them and stick somebody in there. And then eventually we had a warehouse out there, which we, the warehouse we ran for like close to 10 years. And that's, that's where the bulk of it came from. In New York. Yeah. Wow. That's gotta be, 
that's a and just with crime and everything that's got to be just a crazy um environment to run that many lights and deal with that many people too because now when you expand you expand your network Mm -hmm. so you bring in other uh, liabilities yeah i mean we had we were pretty tight on security the way we would bring trimmers and workers in is they would have to like sit on the floor of a cargo van we had a roll gate we would drive in it would lock like once the gate was down they couldn't get out um you know they were locked in until we let them out and and nobody was allowed to leave except in the van when the van leaves you know there was never like we didn't have people like wandering in and out after trimming all day and stuff like that you know we ran a tight ship as far as bringing people there i think most people probably wouldn't even know how to find the place because you know they'd have to keep their heads like low in the back of a cargo van so which was the way because last thing you want is them walking outside smoking a cigarette and being like, oh, okay. Yeah, no, we, so we, we had, we had our own building in Brooklyn. So that was really helpful in like keeping everything cool and contained. Um, and that's sketchy too. It's just funny. Cause it's like, can you imagine trying to explain that you get pulled over and there's, you know, eight to 10 people blindfolded or six people blindfolded, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Blindfolded. Okay, I, wasn't that okay. bad. I wasn't like, <laughs> and I wasn't like, close your eyes, but they really couldn't see out the window. You know, there was one little window in the whole cargo van. So there wasn't, it was, you know, I don't think most, and most, most of these guys were not that ambitious. So, but, um, you know, the people, it was like, you know, you hired all your, your idiot friends. That's who trimmed for you. Right. Like they were allowed to drink as much beer as they wanted, as long as they didn't spill it. And yeah. So, um, but yeah, so that's, that's, um, when you set up the warehouse, you start to build out rooms or you just start to hang lights in open spaces. Like, how's that go about? Oh yeah. We go in and we just build it out. Yeah. You would basically just build it out rooms and, um, put in panels and you know, all that stuff. Yeah. And just rely on friends to start helping basically. Cause you can't hire it out the job, like to a, a general contractor. Or no, and, and back then, like, you know, the best job a lot of people could find was like, you know, like maybe like eight bucks an hour you know like i was paying 20 and if you were actually like skilled in like carpentry or drywall i'd give you 25 or 30 you know which in cash version is like an extra 10 bucks added to that because that's what the government takes out so yeah they're killing it they're making three times what they would yeah and so and they they also they got to smoke weed at work and it was they got to smoke the good weed so they would have come for free anyway you know like basically they would have followed me there if i let them and just done whatever i asked the good days we used to call it using the force you know like you could take a piece of weed like this and just be like who wants to walk my dogs or you know can someone please take the garbage out and like they'd be fighting over it you know and so you know i always had like a bunch of like younger like like upcoming dudes around that you know wanted to like learn and 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 uh and wanted to make be useful so they could hang out and come out to dinner and and hang out with all of us all the time so what were some of the stuff uh as far as getting that sour i mean that sour must have been booming in the city at that point because now you got production larger and everyone knows this is what's smoking this is what everyone's asking for so it's getting in everyone's hands at that point rappers celebrities you know Mm -hmm. wall street guys i mean you name it everyone's smoking a bunch or asking for sour it's on the, I remember going to 154th and Broadway and they would say sour piff mm-hmm. and you'd be like one of each. And then for an extra dollar you could pay, or it was like five bucks or a dollar and they'll roll it up for you. So then they're just like, you, they do all of it and you just get a uh, blunt, but it's like New York, it's just such a different place at that time. Mm-hmm. How are you navigating the market with that much going on? Because I was in kind of like a special situation, like. I would, I would sell weed, but it was because, because I had the sour, I could like make my own terms with all the big weed dealers. Right. So like, I knew all those guys and that, you know, we knew all knew each other. So like, and I would basically say, Hey, you know, like, like, let me go cherry pick, like, you know, through your warehouse and get all the best stuff and I'll sell you some sour. And I'll sell you the sour for, and I'll sell you some sour for nine thousand dollars a pound. So, um, so yeah. So basically, I would like you know I had a couple guys like that that were always like happy to give me anything and let me take it for three or four weeks and 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 go make money. So you know, I mean, I knew a lot of the people, and you know, if you, there were a few restaurants in New York where if you walked in there at like you know midnight on a 
Wednesday, you know, you knew everyone in there because it was like all the weed dealers or like all the, all, you know, all, all the drug dealers of New York, you know, having dinner. So, um, so yeah, I mean, we pretty much, and if I didn't know somebody, like somebody I knew knew them, it was a small, small scene. And you've been in it for a while. So you get to know the players. Yeah. But I kind of laid low and people didn't want anyone to like meet me or know who I was. So, and I, I, you know, I, I wanted to stay out of trouble and I wanted to, uh, you know, not be, I didn't try to get my name out there or attached to anything I was doing. Like a lot of my best friends that I grew up with didn't even know that I grew weed. They just thought that I smoked it. You know, I mean, I didn't, I didn't go around telling people because, uh, you know, you had to be really careful. So a lot of times, like people didn't even know who I was. Like a lot of people would talk to me about me. And sometimes they would even tell me that they knew me. So, and I'd just be like, oh, that's cool. You know, never even, never even like tell them who, uh, who I was. So I always tried to be like that, like anonymous. It's like, that's hilarious. Start hearing rumors about yourself. Yeah. People like start telling me about me. It's like, oh, great. That's when you know you're doing the right thing. Did you ever run <laughs> into a different strain that enticed you away from growing just sour at that time? Are you running into other strains where you're like, ooh, this is interesting? Or you were just strictly sour? Back in like 2007 or eight. Um, Adam Dunn in, uh, introduced me to uh, the Snoop Dogg crew. He was like, oh, the Snoop Dogg is in New York. You know, he wants to go sell him some weed. So, yeah, so I went over there. And um, and then I became like the guy that they would call every time they, that, you know, came to town, which was cool because I got to go to the show and hang out and, you know, get my picture taken and whatever. So, yeah. And they're smoking uh, sour, which is yeah, just which dope. I, yeah, I love that. Yeah. So, um, so eventually, um, his crew gave me uh, a clone of what uh, of what he liked to smoke, which was the RBK. You familiar with the RBK? No. They, they called it Ricky's Brothers Kush. It's like they called it the Silverback. It was the same OG that, like, um, I think. Uh, uh, Kenji and all those guys used to grow, and and I think the same the be real one, you know. It's all, but uh, the Snoop guys called it RBK, so that's what I called it. And then so yeah, I would grow that for them, which was like a pure OG. And again, people didn't want it in New York. It was it, dude, it was so fucking nice, and I couldn't believe. But you could not give any when anything but sawa. It has to be sawa, uh, or I don't want it. And uh, yeah, so it always frustrated me that I could grow other stuff that came out beautiful and people would be like, nah, fuck that. Just the sour. We hear about that and then they would rename it or they would try to get it off as other stuff. And then it's funny, then people start to understand what OG Kush is and start to ask for it by name. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's incredible though. That, that cut right now is like prized if you could get a hold of it or if people still have it. That's I did a, I, yeah, I, we have the RBK. You do? Yeah, yeah, right. Ricky, Ricky from Ricky's Brothers Kush actually uh, uh, is, uh, is putting it out. And uh, yeah, I guess it's uh, Ricky's Brothers Kush. Uh, they, forget the name of his new company, but I, uh, it'll come to me. But, uh, but yeah, Ricky Palomino, who was uh, Snoop's tour manager for like 17 years and was... They're going to put responsible it out. for making sure that like he was like set up everywhere they went. Um, yeah. He's put out the, the RBK. Um, and it's still awesome. It's still my favorite OG. See, cause that's one of the things that comes up a lot in conversations is with the old genetics after this long, some of them, people think they, this isn't the same cut or this, why is this different than it used to be? Or is the genetics just drift, you know, or is it hurt? Uh, so people are starting to TC and try to tissue culture a lot of these cuts and try to bring them back or bring them back to the closest state they can to the original. It's, it's mm -hmm. real interesting, the conversations that come up, because you hear that a lot with OGs, Sour. I have an 18-year-old cut of Presidential Kush, same thing. It's just old, you know? Yeah, you put them out in the sunlight for a month and you take them back inside and they're all good again. You know, that's yeah. what I find. They get rejuvenated. You just got to put them outside at the right time there's like a month when you can put them out and they won't flower basically out here right so power up that's 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 always seemed to to add virility yeah 
how how has it been trying to hold the sour cut over the years? Because I'm I'm sure a lot of stuff comes up. Um, have you been able to have it around your circle and been able to reaccess it, or you yeah, had to keep it? I mean, it? yeah. Then that and that's that's really not, that's one of the advantages too. Then that's why another reason why I I gave it out and sold it like back in the day because. You know, there's people I sold it to 15 years ago who still have it. And, um, and yeah, so it's like, it, it had to never get lost because it was like bigger than all of us. You know, it's like smart. I always thought like the sour is going to outlive everyone who's alive on this planet right now. Okay. Like we're all going to be dead and, the sour, and new slaves are going to be like tending to the sour, you know, because that's basically, it's the way I always saw it. That's a great way to look at it it's genetics yeah and prized things get passed down generation to generation just like anything right it's like back in colonial times you grow the right corn and it actually harvests well and tastes good and you know it hits all the monitor like your people are passing that out saves people lives it's mm -hmm. the same thing with this people are building their careers off of sour diesel and off of some of these strains especially now if you you see people in a tent find the next hottest thing so it could be anybody like I, I try to tell people all the time, like right now with all the genetics being so accessible and seeds and the collaboration projects that are happening, like you could find the next big thing. Mm -hmm. You just have to have the forethought to what could be next. What do we not have in the industry? What's different enough? The seeds are accessible. Mm -hmm. What type of stuff are you working on with the sour right now? Um, well, I kind of like, I kind of mix sour with things that i like uh, i created uh uh this plant called frank rizzo which is uh you know in honor of the jerky boys which is um it's uh, a, a lime crumble crossed with uh, uh sour and then crossed again back to sour and so i i've been i used a male of that to do a bunch of stuff recently and uh you know i crossed it with the orangutan titties I tried to cross it with like a diverse group of things. I crossed it with um, uh, La Bamba. I crossed it back to the sour again. I crossed it with um, uh, the AJ Philly cut sour, just to like throw in a different sour in there and see what happens. Um, yeah, and a few other things. So, um, yeah, I, I, I worked on sativas for from like 2018 to like 2000. 21 i was i was working on all different stuff there nl5 hazes long flowering things so um are you linked up with todd mccormick at all i i mean i know todd okay uh, you know i, I just asked because the only other time i hear about stuff like that is is when i watch todd's posts or kind of pay attention to what he's got going on too because you're, you're tapped into old school flavors that's another cool thing about that idea you had where you would have like 12 or 15 different sours now you can start to breed them together. So it's not only like, hey, this hash hole is this sour and this sour. You can actually take number 15 times 18, or this is our stud times everything in the library. Very cool. I love that idea. They need to expand on that and take yeah, your idea I, with I that. Like that. The sours from around the world, you know? Dude. I could probably go to South Africa and collect like five more sours, you know, that aren't sour, but, you know, kind of look like it and probably are related. People would come out of the woodwork with that project to be like, hey, put this on the menu. Here's my version of it. Yeah. I love that because everyone does have a different version of it that they grew up with or was grown by someone different. So in their opinion, it looks different, right? Because that's a big thing too. At that time, everyone had it was growing it in different places with different formulas yeah. under different constraints. And that yeah, that's another thing about weed, you know, today. And people say, well, you know, OG has changed and and you know, um, but I think that what's changed is the light spectrum, the nutrients, uh, even if you're using the same nutrients, they've changed, you know, the mm -hmm. Promix. I mean, I don't know if you remember buying Promix in the 90s or in the early 2000s, but it's not the same product they're selling today. It was like spongy and it had a very, like, uh, very strong odor. You, you could smell it from like, you know, a mile away if somebody was breaking up a bale of Promix. And now, you know, you can just shake the bag into a tarp and it just comes out. It's not, it's not bricked up. It used to be like breaking up a Mexican pillow, you know? Uh, 
people don't probably don't know what that is, but you know, it's like, like breaking up beds. We used Those to made it. it to New York. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like yeah. breaking up brick weed when you broke up a bale pro mix. And yeah, it's not like that anymore. So a lot of things have changed. It smelled very organic back then. Like you knew you're like, oh shit, this is, this is shit. Um, what's crazy too is you talk to nutrient companies and you'll hear from them when you hear, just like you said, like, oh yeah, they were having issues um, basically getting this part of their formula. So they sourced it from someone else. And that's why for the last year, it hasn't been performing the same. Like you're, you're dead on with that. No, yeah. When you have a, when you use the same grow for 10 years, you know, sometimes you find like an old container of nutrient and you look at it and you're like, this isn't even the same shit that we're using now. Like this is a totally different like formula. And so, yeah, a lot it, general hydro changed over the years, many times, you know, I took notice of that. So I, and I assume they all are. Yeah. Because supply chain issues or whatever. I think, I think Promix ran out of that good sphagnum and they can't, I think they, they excavated it all and there's none left. That I, I think we bought it all. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It all made some root into some roots. What's crazy too, is like, I bring this up a lot to growers and you've been doing it long enough. When we used to go into grow stores, 75% of the products were explaining to you or trying to sell you on better quality, whether it was very little on yield. Some of it was yield, but a lot of it was like bigger crystals, stickier weed, uh, more terpenes, uh, better buds, just an overall quality pinpoint of like, hey, this is why you should buy this. Now, when you walk into a grow store, the only thing you see is 75% less electric cost, higher production and flour, uh, higher yields with less money put out. Very little products, if any, talk about quality. It's crazy to see the shift. And it's exactly what you're talking yeah, about. Because if this bud has like 20% more bulk on it, it doesn't mean it it has more resin on it. So yeah, I mean, all that stuff for bulking up and and and, and yeah, maximizing yields. That was never a priority that I had. Like if I got a pound of light mm -hmm. out of a thousand water, I was like, okay, we did good. Because that was at minimum eight thousand dollars. So yeah, like I would, you know, some people would be like bragging that they could get three pounds of light, but mm -hmm. if you can only sell your weed for 2000 or, or $2,500, then, you know, you can't, you know, you, you're just making more work for yourself. Uh, that's a good way to put it. I like that aspect to look at it like that. Yeah. You're doing three pounds and what you get in one and you're not building the reputation too. That's part of it as well. People don't look at the long picture of uh, the longevity in it of, once you build a brand, people expect this high quality. They know you're reliable. So the word spreads like wildfire. So even if you are getting 8,000 for a pound per one per light, people want it versus it's a passable thing. Yeah, all right, we'll take some and we'll pay whatever. You know, it starts to become a commodity where it's negotiable mm -hmm. versus you have to go to AJ for the sour. Yeah. And you, and you know, as a grower too, though, that like, you know, you can grow for weight that's not really like the way to grow the kind of weed you really want to smoke. I like how you said too, doesn't mean there's more crystals because people would assume that if you haven't grown flour and it's like, no, it's more bulk. Yeah. It's just more uh, plant material. Yeah. It's very, that's interesting. So with what you have going on right now and what's coming up in the future with this New York stuff, uh, what do you got? I guess you're dropping the sour. And you guys are going to have that available to anyone that comes in New York and stop by the shop. Anyone can go into the stores in New York and pick up some sour. Yeah, that's awesome to hear. Yeah. Are you going to be doing any pop-ups or appearances there? Possibly. I mean, I pop up everywhere, you know, uh, so we'll see. Maybe. You know? I need a jar of sour signed. Yeah, yeah okay. man. That, could, that has to go up here, man. <laughs> All right. Signed jar by AJ Sour. Uh so what's coming up in the future? How do people find you? Pay attention to what you got going on, the drops, you know, any projects? Uh, well, we got two Instagrams. I have my Instagram, AJ Sour Diesel. And then uh, uh, we also, with Flower House, I have get.sour. So, at get.sour. And then if uh, to pop up on you or to get in contact with you and stuff like that, uh, I'm sure you love when people pop up and show you their sour. Yeah, I mean, people and people do. Yeah, I look at a lot of sour. Do you uh, you stay full time in New York these days or no? 
Yeah, I mean, I lived in California for the last like seven years, but now I just moved to New York in July. I'm back, back in New York, but yeah, yeah. Uh, not s- not in the city though. I can't do the city anymore. It's too okay. crazy for me. But I'm like an hour outside of New York. Yeah. Oh man, I'm I'm looking forward to having you out here and pop ups and everyone's talking about the sour, the new projects where people are trying to cross it to the new stuff. So you take the old stuff times the new stuff. Like mm-hmm. I love to see the collaboration and I love to see you on the show. And I'm I'm always been a fan of sour diesel. Like me always. Too. Me too. If you had any advice to uh a young grower, what would it be? Anything that you'd like to pass on from years of knowledge or trials and tribulations? Gosh, what would I pass on to a young grower? I mean, I would say uh, so much. I mean, <laughs> you got a lot to learn, uh, Sonny. Yeah. That's what I would say. You got a lot to learn. You know, I thought I knew everything after 10 years, and then the last, but then the last, you know, 12 or 15 years or whatever it's been you know been pretty informative so everything changes so fast i always say like going from a closet to a, a bedroom is a huge difference going from a bedroom to a house is a huge difference going from a house to a warehouse is about another 10 years of learning and every time you scale up you you almost start to like here's another five years figure it out here's another oh 10 years now because let's throw some business in the mix it's it's always interesting. Yeah, after just growing sour in mostly just in New York City uh, uh, commercial spaces, um, yeah, moving to Colorado and running a commercial grow, I I didn't I wasn't ready for that. You know, like we never had bugs and problems. You know, uh, you know, to that extent, like I I was not prepared for dealing with that. Yeah, so the Colorado huge, spider you know, mites are like bred different. They yeah. were like rampant out there. I remember years ago, people. And at the time, we didn't have the solutions we had now, where it's like easier to find the solution for those problems, or it was easier, yeah. easier accessible. Information yeah. is accessible nowadays. Yeah, I, we we learned the hard way, you know, where it took you three months to see if you did it right or wrong, you know, and then you kind of had to like figure out what you did right and what you did wrong and, and try again. Um, and hopefully not lose the genetics yeah that's always the underlining thing and that's kind of the underlining point of this podcast is like save those old genetics keep those things around keep them healthy and i guess maybe your advice would be kind of share them so we don't lose them get them out there yeah i'm you know give them to everybody you know (laughs) give them to everybody some people are going to clinch up here in that but uh, thank you for your time, man. And I appreciate you making time for first smoke of the day. Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks. AJ Sour Diesel, first smoke of the day. Where's that sour at? Hey, stop. Before you leave, roll up another one. We got more episodes just like this. Click right here.